morning. It's good to see everybody. Y'all stand. Let's worship together this morning. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water full of thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet. Honey on my lips, like the sound of symphony to my ears. Yes, yeah, like holy water on my skin. Dead man walking, slave to sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me under baptized. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of symphony to my ears. Yes, yeah, like holy water on my skin. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of symphony to my ears. Yeah, it's like holy water. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of symphony in my ears. Yeah, it's like holy water on my skin. Yeah, it's like holy Look down in the back of their seat. You'll have a, a, an information card. We just want your information. We're not going to sell it on the interweb or anything like that. So fill this out and put it in one of the boxes uh, when you leave. Uh, we're glad you're here. And the usual, we're glad to see y'all here too. So let's get back into worship. I'm going to pray and we'll get out of the way. Father, we love you this morning. And we're just so thankful that we can come in your house and freely worship you.
I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song. So I'll throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for the King. Except for a heart of singing, hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide, I will worship you. So I'll throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a heart.
mon vaisseau dont tu guides chaque au milieu de ton sang. You've got a lion inside of those arms. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of those arms. Get up and praise. have a God that loves us so much that you sent your, your son to be our savior, to die on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And, and this, there's nothing that we can really do or say that is, is enough, that's, that is really worthy to express the gratitude that we have because of, of how you love us. It's, it's not because of anything that we have done, but you just choose to love us. And God, I know that there are people here today that need to be reminded of how much God loves us. And so, Father, I don't, I don't know all of the needs today, but you do. And God, I, I just pray that you will open up our hearts and that we'll listen. And you'll just remind us today how much you love us. And you'll show us today what you would have us do as we serve you. God, I, I just pray um, that... Uh, that your Holy Spirit will move, that you will have your way, and that we will listen. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. John Wesley, um, who's the founder of the Methodist Church, of course, this is the 
Wesleyan Church were obviously influenced by the things that he taught. He talked about prevenient grace, this grace that is is uh, is given to everyone. And so, in in the in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul talks about how how people can just look at the the world that God has created and can know that there is a God and know that that we are um, we are are created in his image and our duty as as humans is to serve him and to worship him and you can see that just in creation and here's what John Wesley taught he taught that there are times that God kind of opens the door for us and he offers us more grace now that preventive grace is offered to everyone but then there are moments in time where he kind of opens the door and we can see and we can understand and we have the opportunity to fall to follow him and you know what I mean by that if you've been in the church for any period of time you know this when the Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts and we say no and we say no and we just don't want to listen we don't want to listen we don't want to listen eventually what happens is we don't really hear nearly as clearly as we used to before and that's what John Wesley was talking about. When he gives us those opportunities where we experience grace in a different way, even more than that preventing grace. God is calling us, and it doesn't, have, it doesn't happen every time you go into a service. There may be two people sitting side by side, and one of them is hearing the voice of God, and the other one right next to them that may be in a similar situation spiritually is not hearing anything. It's, be, it's because God offers us more and more grace, and we have to respond to that grace. And Wesley talked about the means of grace, how we need to give ourselves opportunities to experience that grace. One of those means of grace is prayer. One of those means of grace is the Lord's Supper. One of those means of grace is Scripture. And, and what, Wesley, what Wesley taught is we need to just saturate ourselves in Scripture because you may read, you may read this every day for a month, and you're like, you know what, I'm not really... I'm not really experiencing anything. I don't know that there's anything that God's really doing. And then on that 31st day, you're like, bam. And God and God opens the door and he speaks to you, right? It's because you you constantly, you constantly expose yourself to to what Wesley called a means of grace. It's not we don't we don't read this as as it's a means to an end. It's not, hey, look, I've accomplished something because I read my Bible today. And so a lot of you, a lot of you do this right here every day or many days of the week. You have your Bible and you have your journal and, and, you, and you ask God to speak to you through, through his word and teach me. God, how do you want to change me through your word? And so lately we have this that we are doing. Some of you on Wednesday night. We're doing this thing called the Keys to Freedom, and and I would encourage you, if you uh, if you haven't if you haven't come on Wednesday, I'd encourage you to come. Look, you can hop in. We've only been doing it for one week. It's not like you've missed any much yet, anyway. But you can hop in at any point in time, and it would be beneficial to you. And and this thing right here, I was a little worried because I do this, I do this, and I was afraid that I wouldn't have time. To do this, okay, I mean, some of you can relate, and you're like, I don't know if I, these things right here, they take about 15 minutes, and there's, there's five of them, and we're going over a two-week period, so in a matter of two weeks, you have to find 15 minutes about five times. Now, look, uh, if you're afraid that you can't do that, just turn the TV off for 15 minutes, and voila, look, I have all this time. So, what I'm saying is this. We, the, you got enough time because I, I promise you this. I, I, I'm a busy man. As a matter of fact, I'm reading this book right here for a class that I'm taking right now. This is an excellent book. It's, uh, it's called The Way to Heaven. But anyway, it's an excellent book, and I'm reading this for class. And, but here's, here's what I want to stress. This right here is important, and I want you to be a part of this. But and, and I promise you, every single one of us have time to accomplish the 15 minutes five times in a two-week period. But don't neglect this. You do this first. Amen. You get in the Word of God. That's the means of grace. And you say, God, teach me through your Word. Okay? I want all of you to be involved in the keys of freedom. 
But if you have to choose between this and that, if you feel like I absolutely have no time in the day, I have to choose between this and that, you choose this. You guys with me on that? Choose this. And then turn the TV off and get your 15 minutes for this. But I have to unwind. It's the end of the day. I have to unwind. I have to watch two hours of TV and spend two hours on Facebook. Find your 15 minutes to do this. But do not neglect this. <coughs> and if I'm doing this and reading all this other stuff and I'm not doing that, I need to get rid of this too. And this is a great book that talks about the Bible. But I need to be spending some time in this because this is what I need to do. Okay? So we're going to start today a series in Mark what God wants to teach us through the book of Mark. And so through the summer, we'll be in the book of Mark. And, and since we're starting today in Mark, Mark chapter 1, um, I'm in a discipleship band with Jeff, and I heard Jeff talk about Mark chapter 1 like three times. And so since, since I was thinking, hey, let, let's, do, let's go through one of the Gospels that decided on Mark, I thought, you know what? I know Jeff was, is already fired up about Mark chapter 1, so I've asked Jeff to, uh, to get us started with this. And so uh, most of you know Jeff. Jeff is a pastor. And we are blessed to have him here as part of our church, that he's a pastor. A lot of times he's not here on Sunday morning because he's preaching somewhere. Um, but I, I, got him, I got him before he committed to this Sunday, and I've asked him to start us on this series of Mark. So y'all welcome Jeff Robinson. Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. And I do... I'll, just want to say I appreciate Tim giving me this opportunity. Um, I know a man's pulpit, a pastor's pulpit is sacred ground. And I, I'm, I'm very grateful to be entrusted with it this morning. And a lot of my old mentors, old Baptist preachers, you know, old hard shell Baptist preachers, they used to tell me all the time, said, when you get up there, son, you just clear you off a spot and have you a Holy Ghost spell. So that's what I intend to do this morning. We're going we're gonna to dive into the Word of God. And I'm not here this morning. We're going to be talking about something that's very near and dear to my heart. But I want you to know, coming from a Baptist background, there are differences in thought and theology. But here's the deal. There is no essential doctrine that we differ on. So anything that there might be any differences in, are merely non-essentials, but now that doesn't mean that they're not important, it just means they're non-essential. And if we cannot be brothers and sisters when we leave here convinced that it's got to be Christ and Him crucified that we preach, then I failed in my mission to get the word across. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is in the first three verses of Mark chapter 1. And... I, I title all of my sermons because it, it just helps me. I chase a lot of rabbits if I don't. I'm very ADD. Our pastor is too, I've noticed that. It may, be, it may just be a preacher thing. It may be a requirement. You have to be ADD to be a preacher. I, I don't know, Josh. But I'm ADD, so I have to stay focused. I make a skeleton outline. I title my sermons. And my title for this message is, How Far Back Do You Want to Go? Let's read the Word of God together in Mark chapter 1. It says this, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, which shall prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So, a very deep statement to jump off in. And coming from a more of a Baptist background, if you will, see, I've been surrounded by lots of people. But I have the blessed privilege of not having been in church from a child. You say, how is that a blessing? Because I did not enter into the church as a 22-year young man with all of the preconceived notions being taught from childhood. 
You understand that? Because whether we want to believe it or not, when we're children, we are influenced by our parents, those around us, where we go to school, where we go to church, and it's ingrained very deeply in us. That's why it's so important to be a good parent. That's why it's so important to be a godly parent. That's why it's so important that I get into the Word of God for myself to determine what the Word of God says. Because not everyone, honestly, is a preacher of the truth. So there's a lot of false teachers out there. And I, when I got saved, I didn't want to just take doctrine and say, well, that's true, it's got to be truth, my preacher says so. I did trust my pastor, I grew to love him and trust him, and I honored him. But I found out he was just another fallen man just like I am. And that my pastor didn't know everything. And I don't know everything. And bro sadly, Brother Tim doesn't know everything. But we try. And that's what I love about our band meeting. Because iron sharpens iron. And every week that I go to my band meeting, I come away from there being thankful to be surrounded by men of God like Tim and Andy. It's a blessing. We've had some lively discussions in there. And a lot of our discussions, and I don't know how God did this, but he just did. A lot of our discussions have been about eternal security. Can you fall from grace? Can you walk away? Can you do this? I want to, say, I want to tell you this morning, I'm not going to tell you what to think about that. I have my own ideas. And I'll be glad to discuss them with you one-on-one -on -one at any time. We can go somewhere and get a cup of coffee, and we can talk theology just like Spurgeon and all the rest of them. But what I do want you to come away from here is convinced that you have a faithful Father who loves you to the end. And that, can you walk away? I'll let you talk to him about that and decide that for yourself. But I do want to say this. There's only two things that you can biblically believe about eternal security. One of them is, yes, when I'm born again, I am eternally sit, signed, sealed, and delivered. There's nothing else. Or you may believe, and there's room in the scriptures to think that way, biblically, that you could, in your own will, choose to walk away from the Lord. But it has to be a willful choice because the Scripture doesn't teach that there's a certain limit or certain sin and, well, that's it. I'm done with you. You were my child, but now you're not. I'm writing you off. You can't have that one because it's not scriptural. I will give you the thought of that, yeah, you can willfully choose to walk away from it if you so desire. But I won't give you the one like some of our Pentecostal brethren, it's kind of the hokey pokey. You put your left foot in, you take your left foot out. You don't hop in and out of this thing. You're either in or you're out. Because Scripture says if I can willfully fall from grace and walk away from it, I'll never get it again. Because he will not be crucified again. That's Bible. Go to Hebrews. Decide for yourself. So, let's dive into what the Word really does say. I've got two questions for you this morning and we'll be done. That's, that's a good one. Amen? You think it's going to be short, but it's not. All right, my first question to you this morning is, whether you believe in eternal security or not, what is required to finish my race well? That's my first question because you're sitting here this morning and obviously you've got a desire for God. I don't think you'd be here if you didn't. So I'm going with the assumption of you want to be fed this morning. You want to be encouraged. You want to be challenged. So Jeff and this crazy mixed up world full of doubts and fears and everything else under the sun, when we see people that we never thought would falter, all of a sudden seem to be walking away from the faith. There, there are preachers out there that have preached the truth for years that are now turning away. 
and introducing false doctrines. It's crazy out there. So I want to know what is required for me to finish my race well. Faith. Number one, how far back do you want to go? I've got to have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. If I don't have faith in what he did at Calvary, I don't have anything, right? I have nothing. But because I believe that when he walked up out of that grave, when he rose up out of that grave and he said, I will give eternal life to whosoever will, that's me. And that's you. Thank God for prevenient grace, brother. I believe in it. I believe, I don't believe like some people that God did not choose certain people and he rubber stamped them for perdition. I don't believe that. I believe we are all created in the image of God. Even every lost person, I believe Adolf Hitler at one point could have repented and, and got right with God. I believe that. I'll battle anybody over that. What do I need my faith in? I look toward the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean that God's people can't do all kind of vile stuff? I used to foolishly think when I was a a young believer that no saved person would do some of the things that we do. But nowadays, I've come full circle. I've seen God's people do all kind of awful things. Does that mean they weren't his child? I don't think so. I've got a child right now that walked with God all of his life. And now as an adult, he's not in church. But he's still my son. See, I was just as much his father when I was so proud of him. He was going into churches and teaching their youth apologetics. I'm just as much his father now that he's not in church, that he's not living for God as I was when he was doing all those things. Does that mean I'm happy with it? Does that mean we have the fellowship that we once had? We don't. But it does does mean that I am his father. Father, and nobody can write me off. Nobody can write him off. I can't even write him off. He is my seed. And in John chapter 3, in that conversation with Nicodemus, he said, John, Jesus told John, uh, Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. He's like, Now, how can me, a grown man, enter into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said this, What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. And the two do not intertwain. If you're born of God, you're born of God, and it's spiritual. I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. But I've got faith in the finished work of what Jesus did for me. But that that does not mean I don't need faith to continue my journey in Christ. Because you see, the sanctification process is an ongoing thing. It happens daily. And there's days I wake up, and I'll just be real with you this morning. I don't feel saved sometimes, Dustin. I don't feel saved, and sometimes in my flesh, I don't even want to be saved, really. I want to be able to strut around in my pride and take all the credit for myself for who I am. And you know what? God will knock the strut right out of you because God will not be mocked. The other day, I rode around with my buddy Shane Duke. He's a... He's a pastor, but he also works for the Caldwell Parish Sheriff's Department. And we went to Hooterville. You ever been to Hooterville? Very few have. They have Sasquatch sightings out there. Well, we went up to a buddy at his house, and he's got about eight or ten peacocks in a pen. 
and he hit that siren on that squad car, and then pig, ah, ah, ah. I forgot where I was going with this analogy. <laughs> but it was a cute story. <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you. But God restores us because he's a faithful father. I've got to have faith that in my greatest failures, that he's still going to be faithful and love me no matter what. And I thought about David in this situation because he's an Old Testament picture of the New Testament grace that we have. Remember what he did? He had a man killed. He he committed adultery with his wife. He had a man killed. And for a solid year, David sat there thinking he was miserable, but he was thinking that somehow God just turned a blind eye to it all. And he was sitting there on his throne. And the prophet Nathan, one day God said, I want you to go to David. I've had enough of this. And he put his finger on the sore spot. He told him a cute little story and David got all riled up about this poor man that had to give his little lamb to the rich man who had had some family come in and they wanted to throw a party and he takes the poor man. He's, where is this guy? And David points that, I can see Nathan pointing that bony prophetic finger at him saying, you're the man, David. You are, you did this. But God's already put your sin away. He didn't say, you're done, David. I'm writing you off. Have a great time in perdition. He said, I put your sin away, but did that mean no consequences to his actions? David lived a miserable existence for the most part after that because his own son tried to take his crown from him and did all these terrible things. David lost a lot during that time, but he didn't lose his sonship. Because he had faith in, not himself, but God. I love the way later on, after David had repented, he wrote it down for us to read. He poured his heart out to God. He said, oh God, blot out my transgressions. I was a miserable, wretched soul that entire year but return unto me the joy of my salvation. See, I not only have to have faith in the past, in the finished work of Christ at a a moment in time. Salvation is, is an event, but it's also an ongoing process. I am a being and I am a becoming. See, it it wasn't finished in David, but it was finished at the cross, praise God. But he's not finished with me. I'm not the finished product. You're not the finished product. But we have faith in a faithful father who will restore us no matter what. But it also takes faith to finish our race well. And I think about Paul because... Nobody, everybody wants to go to heaven, as the old song says, but nobody wants to die. Isn't that true? When you really get to thinking about death, what comes into your mind? Very few people think like you, Miss Sandra. Honestly, even professing Christians, our death is something we really don't want to face. But everybody's going to die. Paul wrote those letters to young Timothy, the young preacher, and he told him in there, he said, be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know what happens to soldiers eventually? They die. And most of them don't die after 40 years and retire and go off and buy a yacht and sail into the sunset. Most of them die on the battlefield. And see, in the world we live in, in the American church, 
we're supposed to be the army of God, right? Fighting the good fight of faith. Everybody wants medals and citations, but nobody wants scars. Did you catch that? We love the accolades. We like to see our name on the little marquee out in front of the church. We're coming in to preach. We're doing this. We're doing that. But nobody wants the scars like what's in heaven in Jesus' hands and feet and in his side. That's the only mementos we get to carry is the scars that we carry bearing the cross, our cross, not his cross. Thank God we can't bear his cross. But he did say, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. And he didn't say, get right up to the finish line and then retire. I believe Paul ran, busted through that ticker tape when they chopped his head off. I believe he was singing a hymn as the guillotine blade was coming down. I believe he was shouting hallelujah. My journey is over. I have fought the good fight. I finished my course. I... Could he have stopped running his race? You bet. Many people do. In John chapter 6, that's one of the saddest verses. John 6 Verse 66, look it up. It says, from that time on, many of his disciples turned away and never came back. Up until he said, you've got to drink my blood and eat my flesh, everybody was around for the party. Everybody was around for the multitudes being fed. Everybody wanted to hear all the good things. They wanted to be healed of their diseases. They wanted to see the dead raised. They wanted to see all these things. But when he said that, the Bible says that the majority of his crowd went, that's pretty dang intense and I can't deal with it. And the same thing's going on in the church today. I'm going to say something, you can get mad at me if you want, but a lot of people in a lot of churches in America are nothing more than pew ornaments. They've never followed Jesus anywhere. They wouldn't go across the street, much less across the pond, to witness to a lost soul. That kind of faith, I wouldn't give a half a hallelujah for that kind of faith. That doesn't motivate me to get up out of my seat and go tell somebody about Jesus Christ. I not only was born into the family, I'm living to honor the name and I want to die shouting his name on my lips when I go to be with him. So what's required to finish my race well? Faith. That's all you got to have. That's the secret. But the last question I want to ask you, and we'll be done. What should we do when fears and doubts and discouragement flood around us? Because we are, right? Right? We're bombarded in this culture, in this society with wickedness and evil every day. Every day. I ain't going to lie, I've been tempted to quit. If you were honest this morning, if I had to get a vocal, I bet you I could get 100% on that. Sometimes we do want to quit. But when you want to quit, I want to encourage you to do two things. Number one, go back and read your epilogue. I mean, excuse me, your prologue. In any great liter literary work, there's always this introductory section. We get to learn about the author, or we get, we get this long introduction into what the book's about. Well, I thought about the prophet Jeremiah when I was preparing for this. Y'all know who Jeremiah was, right? He was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, the northern kingdom of Samaria, they had already gone into Assyrian captivity because they had long time ago turned their back on God. And so God sent them off into captivity. But Judah, 
would occasionally have periods of revival and they would have a godly king and they were so God was still patient with them but however Judah had finally crossed the line with God and God said you know what I'm going to punish you you're going to go into Babylonian captivity and he sent Jeremiah to them and Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because Jeremiah Bless his heart, he preached with all of his heart to his people. He told his people what God had to say, and they would not repent, and in the process they hated him for telling the truth, and they wanted to kill him. And he didn't have one, one single convert in all of his ministry. Not one. Can you imagine, Tim, pastoring a church and never winning anybody to the Lord? Never? never having an addition, never baptizing anybody, never celebrating the new life that is in Jesus. Can you imagine? And in, But the first chapter of Jeremiah in the fifth verse, it says this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you ever drew, this is my paraphrase, before you ever drew your first breath, Jeremiah, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now fast forward. He's lived his life for God. He spoke God's word. All he's done is be faithful. And for his his heart and mind and soul, he's got nothing but hate and derision and mock. And they want to do away with him. And they're lying about him. And all these things, they put him in a, throw him down in a well. They do all these terrible things to him. And in Jeremiah chapter 20, I want you to go read it for yourself. Jeremiah wants to give up. And he says in, in verse 7, he said, he, goes, he said, Lord, you deceive me. And that word deceived in the Hebrew is pothal. And I want to tell you what that word means because this is some serious accusations that God is, um, that Jeremiah is making against the Lord. Pothal in the Hebrew is the same word that they use when a man would entice a young woman to go out into the countryside somewhere or he would allure her and he would rape her and steal her virginity. It's the same Hebrew word that Jeremiah uses to God. You know what Jeremiah was saying? God, you raped me. You tricked me. You you deceived me. You told me I was going to be a prophet to the nations and every day I'm in derision and I'm mocked by my own people. Everybody hates me. Nobody listens to me. You tricked me. And then he goes on. He's he's very temperamental. He's moody. I think he's bipolar by now. Because just another verse later, he says, I said I wasn't going to make mention of your name anymore. I w- and the wording in that means not that he wasn't only, not that he was only going to not say something. He said, I'm not even going to think about you anymore. I'm done with you, God. But then he turns right around. Bipolar is all. But your word was like a fire. Shut up in my bones. And I could not hold it within. I'm weary with trying to hold it in. It's got to come out. Don't tell me that God's people can't be depressed. Jeremiah was depressed. He needed some therapy. He needed some Prozac. Can I get a witness? Huh? Maybe something a little stronger. I don't know. Mad Dog 2020 or something. He couldn't hold it in. And then later on he goes, Lord, I'm singing to you. And then in the very next breath, The next verse, he's back in the pit. Cursed be the day I was born. See, he's all over the map. Let's be honest this morning. We're all a little scattered. 
We're all over the map in our walk. Our walk's not perfect. But go back and read your prologue. When you realize that you didn't call yourself, you didn't save yourself, you didn't initiate the contact, that God did that, I wasn't looking for Him. He was looking for me. He came after me with everything. The hounds of grace and mercy. He came after me and He pursued me and I finally, thank God, one day I got smart enough to say, you know what, here I am. Take me. Thank God for my prologue. You've got one too. While he was on the cross, you were on his mind. Romans 5, 8 that we're reading now says, while we were yet sinners, not when we straightened ourselves up. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Go back and read your prologue. But another thing, realize this, that your epilogue is still being written. And it's not being written by man, it's being written by God. You want to know how Jeremiah's life turned out? He died in captivity in Babylon. But here's what God had to say about him. If you were to go to Daniel chapter 9 this morning and read the first two verses, it says young, a young teenage guy by the name of Daniel was reading the prophet Jeremiah in the book. And it says he saw a a passage in there that said that they were going to be down in Babylonian captivity for 70 years, but once 70 years was up, they were coming back home. And old Daniel got his calendar out and got to looking, and he said, we're there. And he ran out and told God's people, we're fixing to go home, get ready. And God kept his promise. And see, that all happened because Jeremiah was faithful enough to pin it all down and write down the promises of God that are sure and eternal forever. Eternal life is not part-time life. Eternal life is not a hundred-year life, a thousand-year life, a million-year life. It's eternal. And so I don't know where you are in your race, and I don't know if you think you can willfully walk away or you're, you're in, and really it doesn't matter. What matters is, is where are you in your faith? Do you believe him enough today to leave this place and be different than you were? Do you believe him that no matter how many times you've fallen and stumbled and failed, and made a mess of everything, that he's there to pick you up and restore you and make something better out of you than you've ever been. I'm damaged goods, you're damaged goods, Tim's damaged goods, but thank God for Jesus. He is the healer. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much that you are the beginning the middle, and the end. That God, this is not about us, this is about you. And whether you gave us a choice or not to willfully walk away, I don't know. Or whether once we're born again, we can't be unborn again, I don't know. Makes sense to me. I'm not going to tell your people what to think, I'm going to tell them who to believe. So God, if there's somebody here this morning that's just not believing you for the present, God, give them faith. Heal their broken hearts. Restore them back to a place of fellowship and right standing that you might be glorified for who you are, and that's the King of glory. Lord, I love you, and I thank you for loving me first. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
say this <laughs> from time to time people will ask me how do you know that you are a Christian I mean how do you where does that assurance come from and I'll tell you where it doesn't come from and Jeff and I have had conversations about this it doesn't come from the fact that you had an experience at some point in time that's not where assurance comes from if you want to know if you are a Christian if you're in if you have signed up for eternal life, do you, and this is what Jeff was saying, do you, at this moment in time, have faith in the finished work, the grace that God offered to you? Do you have faith in that right now at this moment in time? Because if at this moment in time you do, regardless of whether you could walk away or not, if at this moment in time you do have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, then you are God's child. That is the assurance that we all can and should have is, is because of that faith. That's what Jeff was talking about, and I appreciate that. Now, I mentioned this a while ago, and let me say this, because I think this is something that we need to think about from time to time. We, God offers us grace. He offers everybody grace, and, and sometime I'll talk a little bit more in depth about that provenient grace that's offered to everyone. But when God speaks to your heart, you need to respond. You, you read the Old Testament about the story of Pharaoh, and he hardened his heart. He hardened his heart, and it started out, Pharaoh was hardened his heart. Eventually, he said, God hardened, 
Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh kept saying, no, 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 no. There comes a point in time where you're not going to hear the voice of God anymore. When God opens the door and says, here's my grace, it's in that moment that you need to take it. You need to say, I'm all in. The, the salvation is cooperation between God and us. <laughs> he took the first move. He took the first move. And there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves, but we do have to take a step towards him and, and do our part. So when God speaks to your heart, don't walk away going, oh, you know what, one day, one day I'm going to do this. Don't do that because you don't know if that one day is going to come. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. God, we've been reminded today uh, that we have a God that loves us so much that you did. While we're still sinners, you sent your son to die on the cross for us. And, and God, we are so thankful for that. And I pray that everyone here today, We'll take this message with them, and we'll, we'll, we will listen to you, God, and we'll ask ourselves, am I, am I in the faith? Am I living with faith in that finished work on the cross, the grace that God has offered me? Am I living in that faith right now? God, I pray that we can answer yes and, and no, have that assurance beyond a shadow of a doubt, because I know that's the kind of relationship you want to have with us. In Jesus' name. Okay, um, we're so glad that you chose to be with us here today at the gathering. Many of you come every week, and I'm so glad to see your faces again. Um, I want to show you a couple of things just real quick. We're going to do a couple of changes because we have a lot of last minute and announcements that come in every Sunday, and so it's just easier to do last minute announcements. Let's so let you know right off now. I'm only going to be telling you the things that are the most important and most upcoming, but you need to make sure that you get your calendar and everything in order. And it has a data app for the whole month. Um, but it has your most upcoming events like for the whole month and then through the summer as of right now. Sometimes they'll change and add a couple things in there, but it's going to be pretty solid because people are putting things on the calendar, especially for things like camps and PBS. So go ahead and mark those on your calendar all the way through August because if you don't start right now, it's May. You don't have anything on your calendar here in May. Folks, I don't know about, I, I don't want to miss work, but some of you might. So the most upcoming thing that I want you to be aware of is next Sunday. Does anybody know what next Sunday is? It's really important. It's Mother's Day. So we always do something special for our moms and for our dads on Father's Day. And next week we're going to have muffins for moms. Now, I know that as a mom myself, you don't always get to have your muffin to yourself. So there will be extra and smaller versions for your infant and your husband. It's very sweet. Just trust me. So there will be plenty of muffins for everyone. So come a little bit early. Grab yourself a muffin in the back. We're really excited to celebrate our moms next week. So come ready to listen to Miss Angela speak. And then lastly, I want to tell you, if you look in your bulletin, for June, we're going to do another swap meet, which is where we get a massive garage sale where you sell your own stuff. And it will be in the Family Life Center. There's a sign up sheet, though, that gives Miss Angela and me a good idea of how many people are going to be involved in that and how many tables to set up. So if that's something you want to do, there's one back there in the welcome center. And lastly, before you leave today, if your last name is Nelson, Rawhite, Bounds, Albritton, Tennant, Dietrich, or Thomas, you have to speak up and let me know. All right, Angela? Stand up. <laughs> We're so glad that you joined us today. Don't forget if you are a brand new visitor, stop at the Welcome Center at the end of church with your card so we can say hi to you. Let's stand and do this lift thing one more time. Jesus, I 
Every chain. 